Right, these regularly spaced grooves are pretty interesting. You, th these particular examples are found at Cockleburn Beach, just south of Berwick-upon-Tweed. I was introduced to these features by a friend, pictured here to show that the grooves, which are in the limestone bed, are pretty substantial features. Having taken groups to Cockleburn Beach on many occasions, I found it really irritating not to have an explanation for their formation. So my husband Barry and I started investigating these features without a hypothesis and with completely open minds. We started collecting data in January 2018 with no more equipment than a long ruler, a tape measure and a compass clinometer. This map shows the sites at which we took detailed measurements and which subsequently featured in the paper that resulted from this research. The four sites are south of Berwick on the shoreline of Berwick Bay, which has got a very gentle gradient out into the North Sea. The wave buoy shown on the inset map gives information about wave climate in the North Sea close to this coastline. The data it provided turned out to be key to our investigation. Our first site was on an extensive limestone bed at Middle Skurs on Cockleburn Beach with another smaller area of, of grooves found a kilometre south at Far Skurs. We were alerted also to similar features on limestone beds on the north coast of Holy Island at Back Skurs. At Hud's Head, just south of Spittle Beach, are extensive shore, shore platforms of sandstone, which also have grooves. We visited other places where, in order to see if we could find some grooves, in particular at Skates Raw in East Lothian and at Streeder Bay on the County Sligo limestone coast. Neither site showed, showed grooves, but they were very interesting because they provided us with more information about what factors might influence groove formation. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the main grooved bedding plane in the lower Carboniferous Sandbanks limestone at Middle Skurs. The grooves are found at the very far end of the bedding plain, seen here at, at, at mid-tide. You can see that there are no grooves above high water mark and they fade out gradually at neap high tide, roughly where the end of that very dark coloured seaweed growth finishes. Slide four shows the image, the incident, the visible waves at mid-tide level breaking over that grooved bedding plane that you've already seen. Notice that the trend of the grooves is normal to the direction of the approach of the incident waves and that the crests between each wave bifurcates, sorry, between each groove bifurcates. Uh, in other words, it splits. We're not sure why this happens, but it'll be interesting to do some more reading to find out. The bedding plane is broken by several minor faults, and you can see one of them here. Near the top of the beach, at mean, neap, high tide level, you can see the first stages in the development of grooves. There's the incipient grooves. They've got rounded crests and troughs, but they're genuine, generally shallower than they become at mid tide level. <coughs> Excuse me. Further down the beach, at mean, low water, neap tide level, the grooves have a similar morphology. They're, they're obscured by this very thin covering of sand and algal growth. They disappear completely off to the right um, at mean low water spring tide levels. Far Skurs is about a kilometer along the coast, um, also on some banks limestone, and there's a fine old lime kiln at the top of the beach. This small area of grooves is found on a bedding plain which dips at about five degrees towards the sea. And the grooves have a very similar morphology to those at Middle Skurs. To the south, in other words, on the left of this photo, the beds steepen into the cliff and there are no grooves on the bedding plain in that direction. This suggested to us that bedding planes with a gentle dip lying at 90 degrees to the direction of movement of the incident waves were the most likely candidates for groove formation. So it was becoming clearer to us that perhaps wave activity at any site was an important factor in the formation of regular grooves. We also went to Backskurs on Holy Island and we found similar grooves at mean spring low tide level 
on practically horizontal bedding planes. These grooves are narrower than the grooves found at mid-tide levels, although they have very, very similar morphology in general. We went also to the lower Carboniferous sandstone, sandstone beds, which form the cliffs in the foreshore south of Spittle Beach. A number of you will have been to see this beach. The cliff face is formed from massive coarse grain pink sandstones, which dip at 30 degrees east towards the sea. And between there and the foreshore, there are sandstones finely bedded, which are grooved in places as seen in the box in the lower right hand corner. Marine erosion has cut across the shore platform to give a nearly horizontal surface on which the groove beds are found. We were extremely grateful to have the benefit of a drone for this site and the drone team can be seen standing in the top right on the coastal footpath just south of Spittle. Having these images made it much easier to identify the grooved areas on the heavily eroded foreshore, so I could select areas to study more closely. Huge blocks and massive, largely unjointed sandstone were quarried from the cliff and used to build Berwick Pier. You can probably see these very straight um, <clears throat> surfaces on the edge of the pier and on the front, on the top of the foreshore as well. The grooved areas are found on the foreshore just in front of the quarried faces, mostly at high tide level, as well as on the finely bedded sandstones on the shore platform, shown in the box to the left. There's a considerable difference in the morphology of the grooves on sandstones at Hud's Head, compared with the grooved areas on limestones that we'd studied already. We collected just the same data and found that the grooves had similar widths to those in the limestone beds, but the measured depths were much greater. So the sides of the grooves are steeper, as you can see, and in places near vertical, even over undercut. It was immediately clear that something else was going on here. The erosion process were, were different because the material on the beach available for abrasion during wave action wasn't just sand in this particular case, but also pebbles and cobbles, as you can see in the picture. So how did we collect the data? This image shows the extensive bedding plain at Middle Skirs from low water mark on the right to high water mark and neap tides on the left. We divided the exposure, exposure into sections which were largely marked by these tiny faults. The, the plan was to measure crest to crest width and maximum trough depth every two meter intervals for every groove on the bedding plane. However, some were covered by utterly immovable seaweed and some sections of grooves included bifurcations which would have given an anomalous width, so we missed those out. Nevertheless, we collected data at 250 points on this bedding plane. At each point, we also measured the slope angle of each groove trough and I took compass readings for the groove trend for each block. The diagram summarized the mean results we got for depth, width, and slope angle. You can see 69 centimeters, 68 centimeters for the width, but the, uh, on the Cockleburn sites, the depths 13 and 12 centimeters. And we were, we were very struck by the, the similarity between these two areas. They're only a kilometer apart. The grooves at back skirts, however, are slightly narrower and shallower, but they show the same general pattern. They're, they are located at spring, low water mark. So we wondered whether the position of the grooves relative to tide level was a factor. However, you can see on the bottom diagram that at Hud's Head in the sandstones, there was considerable difference in morphology, as we have said, with, with steep sided grooves with closer spacing. There were other things to investigate. In particular, we wanted to see whether joints controlled the groove trends, which was an, an obvious question for geologists to ask. So I measured the trend of every single joint at every site that we surveyed. And we also recorded during the initial data collection how many grooves crossed or followed joints. This bedding on the, the top of the Sunbanks bedding plane at spring tide, you can see the joint patterns in, in a typical limestone. 
The rose diagrams show the pattern for the three limestone sites. The gray areas indicate the two main joint trends. And I hope you can see that one is more dominant than the other at every site. And the dark pink arrow shows the mean trend of the grooves. There doesn't appear to be any relationship between the two. In fact, a very small proportion of the grooves at Cockleburn, in other words, less than 1% were cut by joints. However, at Baxkers, this bottom rose diagram, the situation is slightly different. And there's a geological explanation for it. 20% of the grooves follow joints. That is because the limestone beds at Baxkers are folded into elongated basins and domes, which have a north-south trend. So it's likely that the joint patterns are related to these structures. By coincidence, the coastline runs east-west. So the incident waves approach from the north, which corresponds to the groove trend, as well as the general trend of the joints. Several geologists who looked at the grooves considered that a possible explanation for them might be that these particular limestones had internal bedding structures that, that could influence the shape of the grooves. In fact, many of the beds we saw had planar bedding planes and they often had a silty or muddy interval between each. But at Baxkers, these pictures here, that we encountered uneven rubbly bedding shown on the lower bedding surface on this slide. The upper bedding surface has grooves on it. The rubbly bedding seems to have no direction at all and we couldn't pick out any internal structures in any of the limestones which might have given rise to a, a linear structure that looked like the grooves. Distribution graphs of crest to crest width show the pattern at each of the three limestone sites. And there is clearly normal distribution for the grooved limestones. The greater scatter of results at middle skirts probably reflects the fact that the grooved section of the bedding plane stretches from low water mark to high water mark. So that's the entire extent of the beach. Whereas the grooved areas at far skirts and back skirts are only found well, at fast goes, they're mid tide, and at uh, back goes, they're very low tide marks. We therefore started to find out a bit more about wave processes on rocky foreshores and the distribution of wave energy of incident waves. Now, most en wave energy is expended in the turbulent surf zone where waves break. <coughs> Excuse me which is also where wave motion enables sand and pebbles to be moved around on the wave cut platform. Waves erode most effectively in mid-tide areas, as long as there's some material on the beach with which to erode rocks such as sand or pebbles. Also, wave dynamics calculations available in the literature show that the action of incident waves doesn't explain the regular pattern of grooves that we found. As incident waves travel up the shore, their energy is also dissipated in a different type of energy called edge waves. And edge waves are very common. They travel along the shore at right angles to the incident waves rather than up the shore. So when a wave breaks, some of the energy goes sideways instead of up shore. The existence of edge waves is difficult to demonstrate, but they can be simulated in wave tanks and they're understood best by mathematical modeling. They're standing waves and they have a pattern of nodes and antinodes of different widths. And that is dependent on the time period of the incident waves. The different energy levels between standing nodes and antinodes allow greater abrasion between sand and by sand or pebbles in the groove troughs, the groove troughs are the antinodes, than on the crests, which are the nodes. Rod Sobey, a friend who researches wave dynamics, was able to show us the calculations which we needed because we had to relay edge waves to the groove widths. The, the wave period on this section of the North Northumberland coast, given by the local wave boy, is between five and six seconds, which is consistent with the mean mid-tide crest-to-crest width of the, the grooves we found, which was between 65 and 70 centimetres by calculation. We therefore felt reasonably confident to use this data in a paper to explain the origin of the grooves. 
However, we then had to explain variations from this mean figure, which is what the incident waves tell, we, we sh tell us we should be getting in the North Sea coasts. Um, we had 65 to 70, but it wasn't always that. For instance, the sandstones at Hud's Head uh, are clearly different, as you can see on this diagram. And it's difficult to know whether lithology makes any difference. The crystalline rocks like local sandstones will be different, will behave differently in a wave climate by comparison with sandstones. In sandstones, sand grains can be knocked off by wave action alone, rather than just by abrasion by other materials. And, but we do think that the availability of material on the foreshore makes a difference. And we saw that particularly at Hud's Head. You've got the diagram there. We created a box and whisker diagram. The sandstones are in brown, the limestones are in blue. And this shows the importance of distance from low water mark, which is on the bottom line of the graph. Um, so mean low water spring at the bottom of the diagram. The distance from low water mark on this diagram is pretty much an estimate on my part. We observed all the sites at different states of the tide, but it still wasn't easy to make a, a clear assessment of exactly where spring and neap, high water mark and low water mark on the, the quite complicated coastlines, partly because the height of the waves on any particular day made, makes a difference. As you can see on this graph at low water mark on one of the sites at Hud's Head and at Backskers, right at the bottom of the graph, in other words, the grooves are narrower. And they're also at the top of the graph at the sites at Hud's Head and in block six at Middle Skurs, they are much generally much narrower as well. So it does look from this diagram that the energy from the waves is most effective in mid tide level. So where we get these figures up to 70, 60, 70, 80 centimeters for the crest to crest width. We concluded that grooved rock platforms need very, con very specific conditions to develop, which is probably why they're not commonly found. The bedding plane or shore platform in the case of Hud's Head should dip at no more than five degrees. We found that if there was a greater dip, it meant that the grooves faded out, possibly because the, the gradient of the rock was too great for sand particles to be moved easily up the shore by the wave swash. We visited Skate Raw on the East Lothian coast, which is similar limestone beds to those at Cockleburn. However, there the rocks are folded with limbs that have a dip greater than five degrees, and these beds were not grooved at all. A further condition that we feel is necessary is that each bed needs to be relatively massive, at least 30 centimeters thick, without minor silt bands or any breaks in the rock caused by large fossils. Uh, we, we learned this from Streeter Point in County Sligo, where the limestones were much too finely bedded to maintain grooves. What happened was that the waves dragged off chunks of finely bedded limestone, and so the beds simply weren't thick enough to, to maintain grooves in them. The other requirement is that loose material on the, available on the shore is, is needed because on competent bedrock, such as we were studying, waves alone will not exert sufficient abrasive force to erode. So why do grooves have a regular pattern of crest to crest width? Well, I, we are fairly sure that that is due to edge waves. The calculations told us that. They are not visible to the observer, but they're known to have energy dissipated longitudinally and they're related to the wave period at any site, and calculations seem to explain the relationship that we observed. The difference in the morphology of the grooves themselves can be explained by the available abrasive material on the foreshore. So having done this research, what more is there to do? You may notice that on this picture of the beach at Eyemouth, there are some very fine grooves in the sand which are of course temporary, but that was quite interesting. So we'll do more reading about those. But I'm particularly interested to know about the width of grooves on beaches on other shorelines, particularly those on the English Channel and the Atlantic coast of Britain. Further research, probably done by other people, 
would strengthen the conclusions that we came to about the morphology of the grooves on the North Northumberland coastline. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks to Rod Sobey for help with the wave dynamic calculations, and to Annie and David Robinson, who took the drone images for us. I shall now stop sharing, and you can ask questions. <laughs>